I'm Dr. Harrison Davis. And I'm Dr. Aisha Dickerson. And you're listening to Two Therapists and a Microphone. Hello and welcome to our third episode of Two Therapists and a Microphone. Today we're going to talk about trap culture and trap music and their effects, if any, on society. I know trap music is growing increasingly popular with rappers like Future, 2 Chain, Migos, and, you know, others in just Atlanta alone. Um, in trap music, a lot of people get hooked to the beat, but I know the artists talk about real life in their music. This real life, however, includes drugs, prostitution, crime, and death. Uh, I have to admit that I do personally enjoy music that has absolutely no application to my daily life. Uh, at the same time, I cannot allow my children to listen to the same music when we're riding in the car because of uh, the messages that I feel are sometimes degrading to women. Um, Harrison, are you f- as familiar with trap music? I am not familiar with trap music. However, I am a huge fan of old school hip hop. I'm a uh, child of the 80s. I was in high school in the 80s. So I remember the Sugar Hill Gang. I remember Run DMC, LL Cool J. And then in my college years, you know, that was in the 90s, uh, Tupac, Tribe Called Quest, Outcast. I am a huge Outcast fan. But as I can remember, I could have listened to that music with my parents. Mm-hmm. I listened to the music with my sisters in the house. My parents were not great fans of it, but nevertheless, it was safe to play it. Now, I must admit, I am a little bit out of touch with today's hip hop music and trap music. I had to go do some research on it to find (laughs) out what it really is. And I found it quite interesting, actually. Well, I I know that a lot of non-hip-hop followers may have just gotten hip to the genre because of uh, 2 Chainz' Pink Trap House uh, that was on How Mill Road. I remember. It, it wasn't just the house, though. The, it, there was a pink car. There was a pink stove outside where people could pretend to cook crack. It was popular. Right, it was. Uh, I know it was originally also a marketing ploy, but after a lot of backlash, they added the Trap Church, HIV testing, and some other events. Uh, more than that, it brought new attention to trap music and trap culture as a whole. I know people who had never heard of a trap house or two chains probably uh, took to Google and they found out about them right then. Uh, So I want to go ahead and introduce one of our guests today. We have Reverend Al Holly. So Al Holly is a native of Atlanta, Georgia. He received his education from Atlanta Public School Systems and his Bachelor of Education from University of Alabama, where he was also a member of the Alabama Crimson Tide football team. He holds a Master's in Divinity from Luther Rice University and Seminary. In addition, he is a doctoral candidate in church leadership at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Go ahead, brother. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Al Holly currently serves the youth of Atlanta as youth pastor for Green Forest Community Baptist Church, Atlanta Area High School Chaplain for Fellowship of Christian Athletes, mission staff for Atlanta Urban Young Life, and the founder of Urban Inspire. So first off, Pastor Holly, thank you so much for all that you do for the youth of Atlanta. Man, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me, man. It's a privilege and an honor. I appreciate it. Pastor Holly, you have been in the news recently, and I know you've gone viral uh, talking about your thoughts on 2 Chainz' Pink Trap House since we're on that subject. Yes, um, you know, just to kind of give you, I guess, the history of the runaround and how the story came about, just to be completely honest with you, you know, when the first Pink Trap House came about and they went to the marketing scheme and all that type of stuff, I kind of didn't agree with it then. Because once again, born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, I seen what real trap houses and due to families, due to generations, due to people like even people in my family. Like, um, you know, just to keep it real with you, I got family members who are laying in their grave right now who probably would still be alive um, if it were not for the culture of, you know, substance abuse, drug addiction. Um, that was kind of fits with the trap house and things of that nature. So tell us, Pastor, what, what is a trap house? Well, I, I grew up on the west side of Atlanta in a bankhead community. I'm familiar with it. You familiar with Bankhead Community? Trap House is simply a place where you could get illegal drugs from, uh, where drugs are sold, uh, where drugs are created, um, where drugs are made, and where people sometimes even use drugs in a trap house. Now, the trap house came about because of the drug academic, the crack drug academic that took place in the 80s. In the original um, setting, people would sell drugs on the corner. They would sell drugs on the block. But when the block got too hot, when the corner got too hot, they moved from the block and the corner to inside of the house. 
And so that's where the whole trap house thing came about. So it's a safe place for people who want to use drugs. Fairly safe. It's safer than the corner is what I'm hearing. It's safer than the corner. Okay. Well, I must admit, this isn't the first time I'm hearing of a trap house. I was talking to Asia a month ago. I've had some clients who were drug addicts, and they described a trap house. And the uh, description that they gave, you know, it didn't sound pleasant. It didn't sound wholesome. You're correct, you know, with that's, that's the place where people go to buy drugs and prostitutes also go there to either buy drugs or to uh, provide their services. And so when I, too, saw the pink house on the news, I was surprised. I wasn't quite sure what was the fascination with it based on how it was described to me uh, by my clients. But it sounds like you have the same type of idea about what is a trap house. Yeah, not necessarily the idea, but the same type of reality. Um, okay. Once again, like I live through that. I have family members, once again, who are on drugs, living in trap houses, doing all type of crazy things and all that type of stuff. And so I I feel like the fascination came based off the fascination through hip-hop music because people love the hip-hop music genre and trap music is a genre and people love it and it's cool and it's hip. They felt like, you know, with the marketing of the trap house, that gave them a, a, a opportunity to be a part of of the trap house. And so my biggest disappointment came um, people taking pictures in front of the trap house, things of that nature, but really not knowing the true meaning behind the trap house. It became a tourist attraction for yes. the city is what it sounds like. Yes, yes. But I believe it became a tourist attraction. Not only did it become a tourist attraction, it became a tourist attraction to people who had really no idea of what a trap house was. I'm talking about middle class people, people who live in rich homes and things of that nature, and they just want to go take a picture in front of a trap house. And you got a college degree and a PhD. Why? You really have no idea, you know, what it represents of families that is destroyed and people that is killed and things of that nature. So it's nothing really to celebrate. And so that was the whole meaning behind it. So essentially, there are kids running around singing and rapping about things that they know absolutely nothing about. There are kids who are running around rapping and singing about things they know absolutely nothing about. But there are also kids running around rapping and singing about things that they know about. Um, to a lot of kids in the inner city of Atlanta, the trap house and things of nature is an everyday reality. That's why they gravitate toward it. And that's why they feel like, um, you know, it, it's a powerful thing, an influential thing. Um, my total thing is when you talk about, you know, hip hop artists and the mass influence that they have over the culture, I just kind of feel like that, that, that we owe it to our people as a whole to maybe promote something that would be more uplifting um, than a trap house. You understand what I'm saying? Something so positive. let flow. Yeah, something more positive. But I'm hearing that you're saying, you know, the belief is these individuals who are promoting the trap house, you know, they're oblivious to the realities on it, of the trap house, but yet they're making songs and making money off that whole concept. Because I say it like this, if you go to any record company or any a mogul company, I promise you, you see the people sitting at the table, they're mid-level, you know, um, Caucasian Americans, you know, Jews, whoever they may be, um, at the table making these decisions. But the same people who are on the promotion teams and the a &R teams who are making these decisions about what type of music to put inside our community, they have never lived in our community. And so in essence, they could really care less about what goes on in our community because I guarantee you there is no record exec who's ever seen a trap house, been inside a trap house, or had a family member to abuse drugs inside a trap house. But they'll sign off on us developing that inside of our community because it's all a part to destroy our community. So... Let me tell you my understanding of, of the trap house and, and how the term came about. I think uh, my understanding is that it's essentially uh, an actual trap where people, mostly African-American, struggle to escape uh, if if they're even interested in escaping because, you know, the it's glamorized in the music. There's a cycle of addiction, poverty, and often just kind of an acceptance of the way it is. Uh, the only way to get out is getting on a, a professional sports team or becoming a rapper or death. You know, and, and, and what I like to say is in the 80s and the early 90s, the trap house was not seen as a glorious thing. We knew people, family members, relatives, neighborhood, what we call them junkies or J's for short, who were addicted to drugs, who would do crazy things inside of trap houses. But now since trap music became a genre and in the post, I would say 2000s, post millennial, what you get a chance to see is young people um, esteeming the trap house and the trap house culture higher because they feel like that is a way out.
If I can't make it to the NFL, if I can't go to the NBA, if I can't do anything professional to make money or take care of my family, then one thing I can do is I can become a trapper. And the thing with the culture is now is it's took a whole nother turn to the fact where people say, well, I'm not a trapper as far as selling drugs. I'm a trapper as far as, hey, I work at a beauty salon. Hey, I sell CDs. Hey, I sell books. Hey, I do this. They'll turn anything as, as it relates to making money into the theme and the concept of trapping. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Kind of like a synonym for hustling and exactly. working hard. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, next uh, we want to introduce a special guest, Dr. Joyce Lynn Wilson. Yeah, I'm glad to have Dr. Joycelyn Wilson here. Let me tell you just a little bit about her. I found out about Dr. Wilson. I believe you go by Dr. Joyce. Mm -hmm, Is that correct? Yeah, it's just because some people like to call me Jocelyn. Gotcha. So I just kind of make it easy because of my name's Joycelyn. So that's how it came about. (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) So, Dr. Joyce, I read about how you taught a class Mm -hmm. at Georgia Tech on hip hop. And so I read about it and discovered that you are a fellow in the Digital Integrative Liberal Arts Center at Georgia Tech. You taught a class title, Exploring the Lyrics of Outcasts and Trap Music, and it's a connection to politics of social justice. I also learned that you gave some TEDx talks on outcast uh, imagination. We want to talk about that. In addition, uh, you are widely published, published a number of articles and book chapters and your research is featured in a number of areas and you focus on race, class, gender, and the socio-cultural issues facing underrepresented communities. I was also surprised to learn that you are a Emmy-nominated individual. You produced a documentary and the name of that documentary is Walking with Guns and you feature T.I. and Killer Mike and you highlighted the challenges of youth and the violence that surrounds them. So I see that you've done a lot of work in the community of individuals who are often disenfranchised in our society. Welcome to the show. Thank you. This is a really cool. I really love you all today. Two therapists and a microphone. I'm <laughs> glad you're very clever. That. That's dope. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm re- really happy to be here. So let me ask you, since you taught a class on hip hop and you featured outcasts, um, tell me what is the status of hip hop in 2017? And how can we define it today? Mm. Status of hip-hop of 2017. Well, I don't know if you've been on Google today, but there is a celebration of hip-hop's birth today, August 11th. And they're giving a little short clip of all the elements. And you can – there's some technological software on there where you can actually DJ. So when you ask what's the state of hip hop in 2017, it's on Google. It's being celebrated on Google. And of course, Google has, you know, one could look at it as, oh, is this some way that they're dealing with the whole minority manifesto that they had recently? But I don't think so. I think this was something that was scheduled before that would that even came out. It was on their calendar because hip hop has become so big. It was listed as the top music genre for Forbes this year. So that's the status of hip-hop is being taught at colleges and universities. and It's a global concept. Yeah, we're having a conversation about it now on your podcast. So it's, um, it's become a way, a lens, the lens, to talk about many of these issues that are coming up. Um, but also it's a way to celebrate black culture and African-American culture. So the, the cool thing about hip-hop And the complex thing about it is that we have to talk about the objectification of it, you know, and I think that's what you're getting to. And we also have to talk about the cultural celebration of it and the cultural innovation in it and how it drives the culture, why it has caused us to be sitting here talking about it, and also what the experiences are of the people who engage in it. What are the, why is there a trap in the first place? You know, and the way that it's coming out in the music, because, you know, we're melodic people, we're musical people. There's a cultural tradition associated with with um, expressing your art and performing your art. That's why it sounds good. But then when you listen to the lyrics, it's also giving you a story about what's happening to a very um, oppressed and disenfranchised group of people who are trapped, you know, and so we begin to talk about what are those, what are the issues that are creating the trap. So trap music and you know outcast music, those give us the artifacts 
to actually code and look for certain evidence so that these students can know what the issues are. And it's really the teaching part of it is a, it's a leadership model. It's taking educational privilege like we have and helping students understand how you take the STEM education that you're getting. You know, you're engineers, you're are going to be decision makers, policy makers, gadget makers, you know, what are your social responsibilities and civic responsibilities to the people that you're listening to, the people that you get going in front of a trap house and taking a picture because you're objectifying it. You know you're objectifying it at that point because there are people who have had to live and live out these experiences day in and day out. And some of us get out and others don't. So it sounds like the trap house may actually be an image for some of the tragedy it is. inside the black community and hip hop. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I'm also hearing is that hip hop is much more global than what it was, as I remember it, in the 80s and 90s. It was just fun music. And, and there was a fashion that was um, associated with it and, uh, and a demeanor uh, also. Um, so let's let's hear first a little bit more about how do we define yeah. hip hop today and those positive aspects of hip hop. So in my course, we talk about trap music as a new metaphor for hip hop. And we do that because in a course like this, we study the tradition. We have to study the traditions. Uh, one of the texts that we read is Blues People. And in Blues People, that is a basically a history of Negro music in white America and what that looks like. Okay. So it takes you through um, slave work songs, blues, oh, uh, wow. up through the oral expression. And what you begin to see is through all of these forms of African-American music, there's this conversation around oppression. There's this conversation around drug use. There's this conversation around racial oppression. There's this conversation around economic inequality and and, and fighting for access to school and health care. There's this it's through always all, been it's there. always been there. So then it, it brings up the question of okay, well, have we been is has 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 a name just been put with it again? So trap music becomes just a, a new way of describing an old situation. So that's the way that we study it. We don't like isolate it as, okay, um, T.I. started trap music. Um, he's the begin. I mean, T.I. and Jeezy they, and Gucci Mane, they popularized it when Outkast gave it a name on Spodio de Dopalicious. So if you go back, so this is the part of, of studying the, the, the text and the artifacts. Well, you're educating me. Go ahead. <laughs> There's, and Spodio de Dopalicious, Big Boy, is describing the trap over yep. on Simpson Road, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Charles yep. Disco. Yep. Yep. Ah, I remember and, that. Right. And <laughs> remember he talked about... Family members about them, right. Charles Disco. <laughs> right. And remember he's, ta- he's talking about meeting, his, meeting his, the love of his life. Brown thing. Um, and then he says that he tries to go and get... He's describing the story of a man who tries to go to get a job. But he says... The United Parcel Service didn't call you back because you got cloudy. Cloudy, cloudy fish. Fish. Right. Yes, that is. Mm-hmm. Now you back in the trap. Just that. Just that. Trap. trap. Going to marinate on that for, for a minute. minute. Dun, dun, and he dun, dun, gives dun. you the ideology <laughs> of trap right there. I just got it. Yes. Okay. So this this concept of drugs being stuck in poverty or low income, that has always been a part of musical the musical expression of black people. Definitely. Now yeah. I see now and now it's just there's an image yeah. associated with it. Mm-hmm. And it happens to be called a trap house. Gotcha. And trap music, you know, it's like, okay, what really is trap music? And what's really the I, the questions that you guys are asking? Because we're trained, you know, we, we're trained to ask certain questions. So it's like, what is it and where does that come from? This is just the latest iteration, the latest metaphor so for describing evolved. the old. Hip-hop has evolved to include mm-hmm. trap music. Yeah. Gotcha. One could argue that Jay-Z is trap music. Reasonable Doubt could be argued as a trap music album. Not in terms of sound, right. but in terms of content. The beat content. drop, mm-hmm. and, right? But in terms of content. So one thing that I did like, even though I did I did not visit the trap house uh, myself, but I understood, or maybe I, I came up with my own understanding of its location in a very uh, popular uh, area, an area trendy. where trendy, right? 
where people who thought that they had successfully uh, shielded themselves and, them ch- and their children from anything uh, related to the trap are now exposed to uh, not just the traffic, but the people from, you know, those neighborhoods who are coming over to take pictures uh, with, with this house and this car. They had the car towed. I mean, they made uh, a really big deal about it and then uh, further perpetuated in the media. Um, so Dr. Joyce... Do you think that uh, people can actually listen to the music and really appreciate it without addressing or acknowledging the issues that it creates in the culture? No. Okay. That's why I teach the class. Because I have, I feel like if you're going to enjoy this music, then you have to know what it's about. You have to know what these stories are and, and put yourself in a position to be able to help the situation. So, no, I do not agree with the objectification of any aspect of someone's culture um and i think that's what it turned into i honestly don't i don't know because i haven't been able to i haven't sat down hopefully i will i haven't sat down with two chains to ask if he thought about that when he decided what was his to, purpose yeah what was the purpose in doing that because from what i understand i didn't go either and i I saw it, but I just didn't want to go and go out on how a meal and take a. I just didn't feel like that was something I wanted to do. But I saw it on the news. I saw people talking about it. And I also understand that there was some sort of VR experience that you can have inside. Well, in most trap houses, you're not having a virtual experience. I mean, you might be taken off. Right. <laughs> taken off. Right. You know what I'm saying? Off. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a virtual experience, but you ain't putting on no Oculus mm-hmm. vibes, you know, looking through any type of 3D augmented reality software inside a real trap house. So I don't know. Um, but on the flip side of it, I think it was a way to have the conversations and the necessary conversations that we're having now. Trap music is becoming really, really popular, a really, really po- popular topic of discussion. Folks are really trying to understand what it is because it is something that most people engage in, even if it's just through the sound of the music. Because the melody of it, um, the, the, the way in which the beats are put together is very intoxicating. And I think that's what people are gravitating towards across the world. I mean, Atlanta is like the exporter of the culture now. Trap Atlanta. Mm-hmm. That's what I heard as I was doing my research on it. <laughs> um, so tell me, as a hip hop scholar mm-hmm. and historian, and so you understand the path that black musical expression has taken over the decades, how do you feel about the direction it is in now? Mm. Kendrick Lamar gives me a lot of hope for the new cycle that we're in with hip hop. I mean, there are many ways that we you could identify Good Kid, Mad City as a trap music album. I mean, that if you listen to have you listened to Good Kid, Mad City? I have. So you know you put it together as a film that you kind of like listen to and you kind of imagine yourself. All of those skits are skits of youth in trap in a, in a trap. It just happened to be a trap in Compton. Gotcha. You know, so I like that Kendrick Lamar has brought that sensibility into his music. I like that he is um, really the, I think he sits at the helm of the new generation of MCs and artists that are going to be coming up throughout the year. It gives me hope that hip hop is going to even elevate more. I don't think that, you know, I don't take the position that hip hop is in a bad place. I don't take the position that um, black music is in a bad place. I take the position that what's happening with African-American people right now is being reflected in that music. And it's being reflected in a way that gives me that's what gives me the concern. It's not Not so much the music because the music is going to reflect what's what's in our communities. And if we position ourselves and continue to position ourselves and work together with our institutions. So last week I moderated a panel with um at the Noble Conference, the National Organization for Black Law Enforcement. They had their conference in Atlanta. And the panel that I moderated was about the hip-hop community and the police community and how we work together. And it included 21 Savage. It included Killer Mike, um, the um, assistant police chief for Atlanta Police Department, the police chief for Detroit, 
the one of the actors that plays in the new movie Detroit, they showed a clip of of the of the film and the conversation was what do we have to do together in order to curb the economic inequalities that result in trap consequences what do we do as far as working with our youth to shut so that they don't get caught up in substance abuse or uh, selling drugs or any of them traps or young girls getting, you know, prostituted, any of those types of things that are associated with getting stuck. What is the what is what is the responsibility with hip hop? What is the responsibility with the police and law enforcement? And how do we work together as black people? Not so much caught up in titles, but as just human beings to make the situation better. I think that's what I'm really concerned about because once we can, as we continue to get that right, it's going to be reflected in the music. Mm-hmm. And I think that's uh, one of the things that I worry about is what our youth are uh, aspiring to based on what they're hearing in the music. I mean, the, Migos' Bad and Bougie was on Billboard's Top 100. So is, is that what our, what our young girls are aspiring to be, Bad and Bougie, in their kitchen or someone else's kitchen actually cooking up dope? I know. <laughs> Pastor Holly, you work with youth. What are yeah. you seeing uh, in the community? And what, and what are you telling your youth in your church about hip-hop? Well, Dr. Joyce made a very valid point when she stated that hip-hop music is simply, or the trap culture is reinforcing the reality of what people are living through. However, I kind of believe that when you have the influence of a hip-hop artist, then some way, somehow, maybe, you should reinforce a new culture or try to reinforce a new thing. Yes, that is a reality that some of our young people are living through, but it does not have to be the reality. Um, the reality can actually be shifted. I feel like we gravitate to what we glorify. And so in other words, if we continue to lift up bad and bougie, if we continue to lift up trap music, if we continue to lift up um, some of these things that are plaguing the black community, then eventually um, our black people are going to see it and our youth in particular are going to see it as a badge of honor. Like, hey, I'm from the hood. Hey, all we got is a trap. Hey, this is all we going to do. Hey, this all this how we going to make it. I mean, at one point I was one of those teenagers who kind of saw it as a badge of honor growing up on the west side of Atlanta, off the Bankhead Highway, grew up off trap music, 8-Ball, MJG, UGK, you know, um, you know, TI, all this type of stuff, Pimp C, all that type of stuff. Listen to that music heavily. And I can just be honest with you, as a young person, listening to this music, it reinforced what I saw every single day in my neighborhood, in my community. And so for a long while, I was simply living everything that I saw and heard. And so in essence, what I continue to hear on a continual basis, it became like a mental motivation for me to try to do or repeat what I heard in the music. And so what I'm saying is, as the music comes, it's kind of like um, young people will live out what they hear or they will try to become what they see. They won't try to transcend or transform. Well, I'm saying, hey, hip hop artists with so much influence in the music that they do, if we could kind of change the way that we would do certain things, then we could help reinforce the culture. Does that does that make sense to what I'm saying? Well, it does, because I, I know that what I hear in the music is you're they're talking about selling drugs and they're talking about the money and glorifying those parts. But no one's uh, rapping about, you know, foster care, you know, and then I got abandoned by my mom and my dad my wasn't point. even around. And then point. I lived with this foster parent. and I my went point. to this other my foster point. home. I haven't heard that in one trap song. And personally, I will say this personally. Um, I live we, we grew up. We started off in Bankhead Courts. We moved from Bankhead Courts to Hollywood Courts. Um, we moved from there to East Lake Meadows, Little Vietnam. I'm pretty sure you heard about that. Um, and then we moved from there to the west side of Atlanta, Baker Road, uh, in a two-bedroom house on Baker Road, which is right off of Bankhead Highway. We had 12 people living in our house. And, and the reason we had so many— Two-bedroom okay. house. We turned the sunroom room into a bedroom. The reason we had so many people living in our house, because my mother had to take in her niece's children. Why did she have to take in on these children? Because her niece, my cousin, was addicted to drugs in a trap house, crack, all type of stuff. And so you're speaking of foster care. 
if we did not take those children, then the foster care system, DFAT system would have took those children. And so what I'm saying is, like you said, when the music is displayed, yes, it can be a different genre. Yes, it can be a different metaphor of reinforcing what black America has always went through. But at some point, we have to get to another conscious level to say, hey, let's not keep feeding our young people this. I know we're telling a story. I know we are just simply trying to um, show the life of our likes, where we came from, how do we come up. But we can reinforce the culture by telling the story or changing the story. How do you do that? What's, how do you change the story when that is the story? You know, when, that's, I, I, when, that, when that's a really significant part of the story. That's a great question. I feel like you do that by becoming conscious. You know, becoming conscious. I kind of feel like once you become conscious, like, for instance, every hip hop artist who's rapping about trap music, they're not living that. That's right. A lot of them go right back to their very nice neighborhood. Listen, to, check, check this out. Wookstop, California, they got homes, whatever. And but they're so, making money off of it. Making but money not off of it. living that reality. And so my thought process is you go in the studio, you get a dope beat. Cool. And, and, and look, keep in mind, I'm not a trap music basher. Like, I love trap music. I can't lie to you. Work out, working out in the morning, playlist, too. check my phone, playlist is on there. You know, mm-hmm. I grew up off of, I'm from I'm from Atlanta, so we grew up off of, we've seen it evolve. But what I'm saying is, Dr. George said, how can you change the story? You can change the story by expressing the reality that you now live in. I think Jay-Z's new album, 444, gives us a big um, weight of how you can change the story. Jay-Z can go back and rap about all the stuff that he grew up talking about in Marcy Projects and things of nature on some of the old albums like Dr. George just stating. However, he took the higher road this time. He told his brothers, he told his sister, hey, man, listen, y'all got to invest. Y'all can't be cheating on your wife. Y'all can't be doing all this type of stuff. You can't be doing this type of stuff. In other words, I feel like artists who have the major influence, and I know you're a professor and you talk about this all the time, but I feel like who, who have the major influence, they can change the story through one song for three oh, minutes. Oh, yeah, the story's changing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like 444 gives us hope. Yeah. You know, Kendrick Lamar gives us hope. You know, but you need the 21 Savage. Yeah. You need the note because that that artist Mm -hmm. is going to let you know what's continuing to happen to the youth that. So, for instance, we were talking earlier about um, I have a nephew, 11 years old, and his mom, his dad are in the house. As a matter of fact, uh, pastor went to play ball with him. You know, he comes from a good home. You got to say that. University of Alabama. Don't University of Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> Throw that in there. <laughs> right. And we were just talking about how he is developing a hip-hop sensibility now as he moves into middle school. And what is and so I have these conversations with him about, what are you listening to? Well, he's listening to 21 Savage. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't live that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. But I feel like Part of our role as parents, parenting, teachers, educators, pastors, um, the village, is so that a child like him, although he's protected from that, also needs to know that it's going on. Mm -hmm. And so I take on the responsibility of saying, okay, if you're going to listen to 21 Savage, you got to listen to Arab and Rakim. Come on. You got to listen to KRS One. So I said yeah. we we're now into music sharing. So one way cool. to change that narrative is we have to be we have to start sharing music with the next generation and teaching them about the values of Black expression, about what your what you come from, that you don't that your story does is not does not start with slavery and struggle mm-hmm. that there is a holistic experience and tradition that you come from i think that that's part of changing that narrative that's what jay-z is doing mm-hmm. he just now jay-z was rapping about drug trapping mm-hmm. you know but now he's getting to the point where he's talking about how that lifestyle created mental traps for him even when he got the music yeah so it's still if we're if we're looking at it conceptually, yeah. and this is what I think has to be taught to our kids, that's still some form of trap music. When I part, so all of my students are not African American. I'm I, the my some of my students in there are very privileged, and it's incumbent upon me to talk to them about how being privileged can also be looked at as a form of trap. So we take this, we take a different, 
we take a different approach in stretching that narrative mm-hmm. to create different realities around this music that you're engaging with. Because so everyone if, can relate to yeah, it. Yeah, because if you go outside on and get if you go stand in front of that trap house and objectify it, you know you're doing that because of your your privilege, right. your trapped privilege. You because you're safe on how <laughs> safe. Safe, you know what I'm saying? You so you put a turn on it and they begin to say, Well, okay, and I know this to be the case, one of my students um, she's a white student. Part of her reason, she said, for gravitating towards the class and gravitating towards hip hop is because when she moved to Atlanta, many of the things that she was taught by her parents just didn't hold weight. Her parents were very conservative, mm-hmm. had very staunch views about people of color. And when she got to Atlanta and saw diversity and saw um, a different story, but also another story, a poor story being told. I mean, we have to keep in mind Atlanta's has one of the largest income gaps, but that's a whole nother oh, yeah, trap correct, story, yeah. right? And so she said it just didn't hold weight. And she realized how closed-minded she was around issues of race and how it was um, causing her to make certain decisions about people. That's how stereotypes get created. So part of white folks doing their work is realizing that you might not be in a trap environment. You might not be in a in a in a in a in a bando. You might not have on a trap suit. You might not be on Simpson Road. But if you're up there writing policy and zoning, redlining, that's coming from a place where you're trapped because your privilege is allowing you to do it. Your um, your racial privilege, your economic privilege, all of those things are allowing you to make. And where do those things come from? A course like this in hip hop, this is why, again, it's important that we're able to really look at so many different stories is so that that narrative can get not only get changed for the youth that you're working with, but white folks who are going to have to teach their people. Yeah. As well, that everybody got to do the work. That's why hip hop is so great. It's the great equalizer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the great unifier. It's the great message maker. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's not by happenstance that hip hop culture is being taught in all of these educational spaces and in churches where you have a pastor who's able to pastor and counsel through a hip hop lens. There's a reason why we have that because it allows you to be 100 it allows you to be real and authentic yeah. in what's really going on yeah. that's the whole consciousness of it that's how you get that narrative changed mm-hmm. and now that we got generations where you got a Jay-Z who's 47 you have a Kendrick Lamar who's 27 and, yeah. and you got a 21 Savage who's 24 you got these different generations of men who are influencing music and telling very different stories of a generational experience Experience. My 11 year old nephew has to hear all three of those so that he can make sense of what's really going on and use his privilege of coming. You I mean his his parents are he's pretty well protected, but when he gets out and 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 goes to play football, he's still a young African American man. Mm-hmm. He needs to know how to navigate this world. And he has people to help him to do that. And he has people to help him do it. But what I'm curious about, Pastor Holly, sure. what happened to the kids who don't have that type of protection? Yeah. Yeah, they don't have that parent question. or great that question. aunt. What happens that's to them? That's a great question. We and, have and, to do and that I was, work. <laughs> and, and I was going to reinforce that and come back to that. What happens to those kids is they end up in a system. Or they end up trapped. What system? Not uh, all of them. Not all of them, but this, this is what I say. I'm telling you from my experience. What do you see? That's what I want to know. Yeah, from my experience. Like, okay, so they have to, you know, navigate through the different generations, the different genres of music and things of that nature. Okay, so you privilege, you 11-year-old, you know, you got two college-educated parents, but okay, so you listen to trap music and things of that nature. I'm reminded of a song on Tupac's album, um, Shawty Wanna Be a Thug. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that song. Mm-hmm. And this song, Tupac is, is describing a middle-class young guy Mm -hmm. who seen a life that he wasn't from (laughs) but decided that he wanted to live it. And -hmm. then he told the story of how it ended up happening. Well, in other words, what I'm saying is sometimes when it comes to all generations, um, our kids will listen to the music, but sometimes if they don't have a good role model, if they don't have good parents, if they don't have a a preacher or a minister or a football coach or anybody in the community that can help them decipher through the music and get to the next level, then what they simply do is they live out what they hear. And because they're living out what they hear, they simply become what they hear. And so what I'm simply saying is, 
you know, even when it comes to this standpoint or even with it being a different genre and a different metaphor, I still think we have a responsibility as village leaders to make sure that we instill in each and every one of our young people that, hey, this music that you're listening to, I know the beat is good. I know it's catchy. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds good. But listen to me. This is not your reality. Mm -hmm. Or it could be your reality. You could be growing up in this area, but this is not your reality. Don't go out and try to make what you hear your reality. Because in essence, uh, the, the artists who are rapping this, they may have grew up and seen that, but they are no longer living what they are rapping. And so while they are living comfortably, while they're living rich, while they, you know, living all type of things, here it is, you're trying to live this part of your life and you can't make it through. Am I making sense here? Right. And, and so I've seen a lot it's of young people. A lot of, dangerous. Case in point, I'll say this. On my way up here, I just got a call from a parent. Um, it's a young man I'm mentoring um, at our church. He was literally shot in the head. He survived. He survived. All right. So right now she's having problems with him. Hasn't been home all week. Struggling. Things of that nature. She called me. Hey, I haven't talked to him. I don't know where he is. Things of that nature. She calls me this morning on the way up here. While we're about to do a session on the tripod, she tells me, Pastor Hollis, just talked to my son and I found out where he was at. He's in a place that he has no business at. He's in his trap house mm. over off South Harrison Road. And I don't want him over there because I know all they do over there. Is smoke, weed, so on, so whatever, 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 and I do not want him in that. Case in point, this young man was raised, good home, two parent home, middle class, resources, resources, everything, but some way, somehow, he has fallen victim to this whole culture you that's being that is, promoted. Let me ask you this: so, you, what? I, and I just want to be clear about what you're saying sure. is. Are you saying that it's hip hop and rap music that has caused him to make that shift? No. What caused him to want to be a thug? Yeah. And first of all, let me say this: I'm not saying he wants to be a thug. Okay. But I am saying this, and I'm it not. Sounds more like a victim. There you go. I'm not necessarily right. saying that hip hop culture um, has caused him to make this shift. But I, what I am saying is that I believe that, like you said, right now, according to Forbes, hip hop culture is the number one grossing music genre in the world gotcha. that's worldwide that tells you that hip-hop has an incredible amount of influence not only in communities not only in neighborhoods but in business rooms um on commercials with products things of that nature we're forced to be reckoned with no doubt about it and so what i am saying is this i do believe that because hip-hop is so strong and it's so powerful that while it may not play a major role in him being where he is now mm -hmm. i do kind of feel like it could play a minor role you understand know mm -hmm. what i'm saying because once again we are i want to go to this level but we are spirit beings mm -hmm. you know living in an earthly earth mm -hmm. world and so if we constantly hear something over and over again, that gets inside of our spirit. It gets inside of our psyche and we begin to manifest mm -hmm. what we hear. And so we can't go around it. We just can't say that. Oh, it's just a beat. But I'm listening to these lyrics over and over and over again because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so what's coming out of my, my mouth is in my heart first. And what's going in my ear is eventually going to get to my heart. And if it's in my heart, it's going to come out in my lifestyle. And so we got to understand that these kids who are listening to this music over and over and over again, yes, they may see it as a reality. Yes, they may see it. But eventually it's going to come out in their lifestyle, in the decisions that they make. I was a public school teacher before I became a minister in Atlanta public school systems for 12 years. I taught in the hood, Frederick Douglass High School. I taught at Booker T. Washington High School. Um, I taught at all these schools. So we, I seen them from Bankhead to the Bluff. And I seen kids who, who made it. Um, from less privileged situations and I've seen kids who did not make it and I can honestly say this that a lot of our kids during their formative years from ninth grade to 12th grade or from 13 to 18 years old music plays a huge role in the way that they think so it's a big influencing factor part of this definitely package, part sure. of this it's the strongest Shakespeare it's the strongest that mother parents whatever yeah. it's strong they love it like music plays a huge role in the way they think Let and so what I'm saying though. is the artist should think differently about putting music out that will reinforce negative behavior from our young people, cause them to rise up and think on a different level. That's all I'm saying. I wonder, though, like when you said there were those at the bottom who made it, those at the top. Who, what was the common? Ex I'm just thinking, like, what's the what was the common theme between those kids that caused them to get out of whatever situation they were in? 
You know what I'm saying? I'm wondering if it was because I think oftentimes we fall victim to our own stereotypes. Sometimes like I don't like this tag of single family homes True. because I don't think that. I think it buys into this Western idea of what a family is supposed to look like. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have to do is, I agree, like everybody in the village has to now begin to see a child as their own or having some sort of influence. And we've kind of gotten away from the way that we discipline our children, the access that we can have to them, the teacher, the way we just totally socialize. So I hear you in terms of the music. Mm -hmm. I hear you in terms of hip hop. But there are so many other pieces that have to go along with that influence. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm Mm -hmm. saying? So this summer... I'm working with students from Washington High School in a a program called Raising Expectations. And the whole um, session was we went in, did some hip hop pedagogy with them, showing them how to use, you know, look at these lyrics and glean from them stories, themes, ideas, issues. And then from there, we taught them how to use an iPhone and use iMovie to edit their own mini documentaries on the issues that they're concerned about in Vine City and the issues that they're concerned about in the Bluff, the issues they're concerned about on the West Side. These are students from Washington High School. It was about 30, 40 of them. And I realized, so you have to understand what's happening with me at at this time is I'm just moving back to Atlanta. So I'm coming back, and although I'm home frequently, and I have been home frequently, Moving back and really getting back into the community, you're going to see things that you were ne- weren't necessarily seeing. And I'm wondering, like, what are the teachers doing in the schools? And it's not a judgment on the teachers because I understand the system and the the high stakes testing and all of the issues that go along, the bureaucratic issues that ties the hands of a teacher to do what they really like to do. But what I'm saying is it's coming out with these students. We did group work and they were all in different groups. They all gave themselves names. They were all assigned different songs. So one one group had Ladies First from Queen Latifah. Oh, yeah. Another group had some Tribe Called Quest. And then, you know, just kind of, um, I can't remember what the other songs were, but one side called themselves the West Side Migos. Then another <laughs> group called themselves the Black History Rhymes. Like After they were taught to code these lyrics and pull, pull out these issues, we would talk to them about the experience. And one thing that they would say is we really liked working together and i was like do y'all not work together ah that was new for them Mm -hmm. like sitting in groups collaborating with one another listening to each other listening to each other that's that's a style of learning Mm -hmm. and development that at least in my experience with these students weren't necessarily getting so i remember talking about them like you know the students aren't being taught the game I remember being at Maze. We got taught the game. We got taught how to navigate through the crazy, you know, reflecting on it as crazy, but not knowing that you're involved in this type of cycle of socialization where the music, the artists, the teachers, the parents, the cousins, the mama, the auntie, everybody is involved in your come up. Here you go. That ain't happening. So, so we have to have a conversation also about our family structures mm-hmm. if we're going to change that narrative yeah. like you're talking about and really begin to deal with putting, continuing to put our community back together. And you know what I believe, that that's, that's a great point, Dr. Joyce. And um, to your credit, when you talk about the family structure, because a lot of our kids don't have a family structure, you start out the question asking what is a common theme between those two and how did they come up? I believe that because our students don't have those families at home and things of that nature, that that's why the music is such a strong force. So now check it out. If I ain't got a family at home, if I ain't got an uncle, if I don't have a coach, if I don't have cousins telling me how to navigate to do the right thing, then guess who the first voice I'm going to listen to tell me what to do? 21 Savage. I'm listening to Amigos. I'm listening to Chains. I'm listening to T.I. I'm listening to all of these people. They're now giving me the directions that I need on how to navigate through life. So they tell me I should treat a young woman this way. Then guess what? I'm going to treat her that way. They tell me this is the way to make money. This is how I'm make money. Why? Because I don't have that family structure at home telling me how to do it. Once again, speaking on my story, my father went to prison. I was five years old. So we were raised by my mother and my grandmother 
and the community, mm -hmm. football culture, things of that nature. So what made the difference is having those people in our life to help us decipher the difference between what was reality and what was fake. And so I feel like when it comes to the music genre, we have to make sure that we have a responsibility to make sure that the young people know what's reality and what's fake. And I noticed you said um, that you had those young kids working together and they said that they love working together. Check this out. I don't think that trap music sometimes and most of music when it comes to the music they put out to our kids, it don't teach them how to work together. I feel like it teaches them how to be separate. I feel like it teaches them how to be savages, right. how to compete. Well, and then that's um, what you, they're you teaching them in the you school, You better than me. Too. I got a bigger car. I got bigger rims. I got bigger this. I got, bigger, I got a bigger house. I got mm -hmm. my woman found her, my girl found her, she a dime, all this type of stuff. And, and I've seen that whole culture go straight down to the school. There are kids who will not come to school if they do not have brand new shoes on. Right. True story. That's also social media. That Instagram is a beast. It is. And Snapchat. It like, is. It really, it has, it's a way for people to connect, but it also, and I'm sure as, as clinicians, y'all, I don't know if you <laughs> see this, but I'm sure you know, like, it feeds into, like, this self-aggrandizing or, like, oh, definitely. this exactly. self-esteem. You like you, It really, like. If you got some, right, you got an increase in, in ways to bully people, yeah. an increase in ways to separate yourself, and it's really happening with our girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I'm noticing like you know they they bully each other through social media based on beauty standards mm -hmm. that they're getting on social media, and what's happening in the schools, and who's talking to this person, and and we can see that in the rap videos and we as see, well. Exactly, we see it on love. That's the issue that I take with with these reality shows where women end up fighting. That's yeah. the issue that mm -hmm. I take with the producers of the shows who are also, that's, that's, that's another topic. And that's fun. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not, but I'm not against you though. producing a love and hip hop show. That's great. Love and hip hop is a great concept. I just, but when you do some, you have to answer for why there is a promotion of girl fighting. Gotcha. And a lot of those women have a lot of trauma in their background, right. and that's not being addressed. I would mm -hmm. love to see them come together and do some type of love and hip hop therapy. Yeah, yeah. so and, and they've <laughs> tried, but it also it comes it comes off kind of forced. Mm -hmm. You know, I see them sometimes at them reunion shows trying to deal with it, but it's like the reunion show is really like an oxymoron because you've let them go. It's been a season time. of crazy. Right. So stop trying to act like at the reunion show you're trying to solve some issues that you help create. So it can be debated that the reality shows, Love and Hip Hop and other shows like that, um, are uh, a reflection of reality. Just like I've heard you guys mention about trap music and some of the rap music that's out there. So a question has just come up in my head. You know, some of the trap music and rap music and some of those rap videos, they're highlighting some of the realities in certain communities. And, the que and it's not pretty to look at either. And it's not always easy to hear. But the question is, if those rap artists are not going to highlight those realities so the rest of us can see them, who else will do it? Maybe they are highlighting them. Like, what, I, I don't think we can assume that they're not highlighting. No, no, they, they, they not... are. But, but I'm, 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 the question is, if they don't do it, the rap artists, mm. the trap artists, if they don't highlight oh, that information, yeah. who else will do it? Mm -hmm. So is it a possibility that some good, something positive can right, come out of this? Question. Because they're showing, look what's happening in the hood. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that's the silver lining. Yeah. Okay. The silver lining is, there's an old adage that says, nobody can tell your story like you can tell your story. And so the silver lining is, yes, you're telling a story of what is going on in black communities on the United States of America. Yes, you're telling the some story and the plight of of a lot of these communities. Yep. However, once again, I feel like there has to be a shifting in our conscious level in our thinking okay. to retell the story in a positive way. Because if you keep telling the same story over and over and over and over again, you're going to get the same thing over and over and over again. You know what? I was really impressed with, if you haven't taken a look at 21 Savage's oh, yeah. um, interview on Everyday Struggle, it does. He's a he's a really smart guy. Very, very. He's a very smart guy. Intelligent. And I realized that just by reading some of his material, reading some stories that were written about him. But then when he was on this panel, he made some good points. And one of the things that he pointed out um, when a lady asked him about working with youth, there were two things he said. 
the lady said, as you know, I work in the Miami Police Department. We have a youth um, empowerment program or things that we're trying to do in the community. But oftentimes we get in the middle of friends. So if one friend finds out that you're, you know, going through a youth program at with the Miami Police Department, they make fun of them. And so they end up dropping out the program. Yeah. So Mr. Savage says, how old are these kids? And she said about 15, 16. And he said, that's too late. By then, they have already formed their thoughts about police. If those relationships are going to it's get reinforced rain. or get developed, two things have to happen. We have to be able to see the police and law enforcement in the community a lot younger, two, three years old, doing things more than just coming into community to arrest somebody, coming into community to do any of the type of stuff that they see. And he was like, that's why you hear it in my music, because my experience with the police has never been positive. So if we want to make positive music. And he said it. He was like, you know, if it, if if I'd had that relationship, it would be in my music. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And he said, you know, so those types of things have to begin to shift the narrative is like going back to seeing ourselves as human beings mm-hmm. rather than who we are in our titles, but who we are in those titles and what they can do to build us back up. Mm-hmm. That's where I think that shifting is going to take place. Otherwise, you're going to continue to hear it in the music. Thank you so much. I think all of those are uh, really great points. I thank you both for coming in with us today. You've given us a lot of great information uh, about hip hop culture and specifically about trap music and trap culture. Not only that, I think we've been able to talk about some solutions and things that we can put in place, like our music sharing, like mentoring. So again, thank you both for what you're doing in the community. Absolutely. So thank you guys for coming out. You've educated me. You've (laughs) uh, talked about trap music, what it means, what it looks like, the hip hop culture. I heard some positive, beneficial things with it. I think I have a stronger understanding about hip hop and trap music. So I just want to thank you guys for coming out and coming on our show. Thank you so much for having us. We appreciate it. Thank Thank you. you. This was awesome. Thank you. Amazing. Maybe we'll do it again some other time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) You can check us out at www. Two therapists, that's T W O therapists with an S dot com, or link up with us on Facebook. Just search for Two Therapists. And I'm Dr. Harrison Davis. I'm Dr. Aisha Dickerson. And we will see you guys next time. <laughs>